So I'm going to talk about some of the world's happiest people and the lessons they give us about being happier. But I thought I'd start out with you and maybe telling you something about yourself which maybe you didn't know. So I'm going to ask you two binary questions. One is about the quantity of life and the other one's about the quality of life. I want you to raise your hand uh, to one of the questions. The first question I'm going to ask you uh, is a question uh, if you think life is long or short. Okay, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. You can only raise your hand to one of them. Raise your hand if you think life is short. Now raise your hand if you think life is long. Okay. <laughs> it's maybe a short conference. <laughs> All right, now uh, this is about quality of life. Raise your hand if you think life is hard. Think life is hard. Now raise your hand if you think life is easy. All right. <laughs> So a guy named Michael Norton, a Harvard researcher, led a, a team of researchers from a few universities from around the world, and, and they surveyed 2,500 people, and they asked those exact same questions, and they correlated it with happiness. And sadly, they found that the people, well, before I do that, I'd, I'd probably tell you the results. I'd like the people who think that life is long and easy to stand up. Anybody raise their hand to both, long and easy. All right, stay standing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you're going to like the outcome. <laughs> so the least happy people, and actually the majority of respondents, were people who thought that life is short and hard. And in the middle were the people who thought life was short and easy and long uh, and hard. But the happiest people, the people who were 20% happier, as represented by this young lady right here, <laughs> were the people, and this lady here, why don't you two stand up just one more time? Just one more time, hold it. <laughs> These are the happiest people in the room. And by the way, they're more likely to vote and they're more likely to be generous. So these are the two women you want to invite to your next fundraiser. <laughs> I'll be hitting you up for money afterwards. I'm no, just kidding. So for the last 13 years, I've had the honor of working with National Geographic and have developed somewhat of an expertise at finding the most extraordinary populations in the world and then learning their secrets. And part of that is doing careful measurement ahead of time. For the, this first project, we actually spent two years to identify uh, five parts of the world where people live statistically longest. Then we recruited a team of experts who could help us uh, go to each of these places and distill out their lessons or the common denominator. So in a sense, we reverse engineered longevity. Uh, I wrote this cover story in, in 2005 and found that no matter where you go and find extraordinarily long-lived people, whether it's Europe, Asia, the United States, or Latin America, you see the same nine common denominators. Number one, they don't really exercise in the way we think of exercise, but rather they live in environments that nudge them to move every 20 minutes or so. For the most part, they live in walkable communities. They suffer the same stresses that we suffer, except they have sacred daily rituals that help them unwind that stress and get rid of some of the chronic inflammation that is the core of every age-related disease. They have vocabulary for purpose, which is worth about seven years of life expectancy. Good news based on what I've observed at the conference, they do drink a couple glasses a day, most often with meals. And uh, no, you cannot save up all week long and have 14 on the weekend. Uh, we did a meta-analysis at diets of longevity all over the world and found that 95% of the dietary intake of the longest-lived people are low-processed plants. Grains, greens, nuts, and beans. Beans are the cornerstone of every longevity diet in the world. If you're eating about a cup of beans a day, it's probably worth three or four years of life expectancy. Their, their houses are set up so it's easier to eat the right food and they have strategies to keep from overeating, like saying a prayer before meals or taking electronics out of the kitchen. And the foundation of every uh, longevity culture in the world is how they connect. They tend to put a priority on family over work and hobbies. They tend to be religious. People who are religious and show up at least four times a month live four to 14 years longer than people who aren't. And they curate their tribe. 
We now know that if your three best friends are obese and unhealthy, there's a 150% better chance you'll be overweight. So how you select people to surround yourself with probably has the biggest lasting impact on how you're gonna live. The biggest finding when it comes to longevity, and I think this is the disruptive part, in America, we tend to pursue health. But where people actually live the longest, they have no idea how they live so long. You find these 100-year-olds who are water skiing or standing on their head, and you ask them how they got to live so long, and they really have no idea. The truth of the matter is longevity happens to people. These guys or women never say at age 50, well, go darn it, I'm going to get on that longevity diet and live another 50 years. They don't buy treadmasters or accelerometers or sign up for the wellness program at work. The bottom line is they live in environments that make the easy, healthy, cho the, the healthy choice, the easy choice, or the unavoidable choice. No matter where you go and you see long-lived people, you see these, these same five factors that are ingrained in their environment uh, that make this easy choice, um, the healthy choice, the easy choice. So now what about happiness? 15 months ago, uh, Susan assigned me the story to do the same thing with happiness. And to start off, you have to be able to measure happiness. With longevity, it's pretty easy. You can find a guy who tells you he's 100, you can check his birth certificate, and it's really just a mathematical exercise to confirm that he's indeed 100, and this is what demographers do to populations, confirm ages. But how do you do this with happiness? You can see somebody who's smiling today, but they may be glum for the next six days, or they may be depressed, or they may, you may just be catching them right after happy hour. How do you measure happiness? And how do you measure it for the whole world? Well, it turns out there are two statistical tools we can use to do exactly this. The first tool is something called the representative sample. So the representative sample says that if you can find, if you can analyze just 1,500 individuals out of a big sample, you can extrapolate to that whole sample. And I'll give you an example. Imagine a swimming pool with 100 million marbles. Some of those marbles are black, some of those marbles are white. And you're given the job to tell me what, how many of each marbles are in the pool. Well, if you close your eyes and randomly select just 1,500 marbles and count those marbles and find that 39% are black, 61% are white, you can be pretty sure that in this whole swimming pool there are 39 million white marble, uh, black marbles and 61 million white marbles. So that's the first tool. The second tool is called the regression analysis. So psychologists over the years, and these psychologists have won Nobel, Prize, have Nobel Prizes, have developed questions that measure different kinds of happiness. How you evaluate your life, how you experience your life, and purpose and meaning. Those are the three main ways that we uh, assess our lives, then we can actually measure it. And then they ask another number of demographic questions about age, ethnicity, gender, income, 75 other questions. And then doing this regression analysis is just basically math. You can establish the correlations. I am going to tell you what sorts of things you can do to make it more likely that you will be happy for the long run. And to do that, I want to profile three of my favorite countries. The first country, not too far from here, Singapore. Country of five million people, the tip of Malaysia. Extraordinary place, it has one of the highest GDPs in the world, one of the lowest rates of corruption, one of the highest life expectancies. It has the highest life satisfaction in all of Asia. No, not the islands of Tahiti or Fiji. No, not Bhutan. Bhutan is actually about number 91. It's not as happy a place as we think. Uh, but this little island nation that's very clean, uh, even though the island is 70 miles long, or 70 kilometers long and 20 kilometers wide, it has 256 shopping malls. It's a shopper's paradise. So the chief architect of this um, uh, social experiment, Singapore is only about 50 years old, is Lee Kuan Yew. This fellow here, he sadly passed away, but he is a Cambridge educated lawyer who speaks the Queen's English, but supremely understands Confucian values, the values dominant in Asia. Uh, he understands the notion and the importance of respect, 
harmony, hard work, uh, respect for elders. And he went about shaping a community that made it easy to live out those values. Very important. Not always easy. He inherited a country, or he took power of a country, that was very ethnically diverse. About 70% were Chinese, ethnic Chinese, Han. Uh, about 13% were Indian, and about 12%, 14% rather, were, were um, uh, Malay Muslims. So uh, this is a recipe for ethnic strife. Uh, but interestingly, there's hardly any ethnic strife and you'll, you'll hear a few anecdotal stories, but actually it's a country that gets along very well together. How did that happen? Well, he was under, Lee Kuan Yew and his, his uh, government were under a good bit of pressure to make Chinese the lingua franca, but, but that would favor one of the ethnic groups. And instead of doing that, he made English the lingua franca, which not only favors a fourth, it doesn't give anybody an advantage, but also was an advantage uh, for the finance industry. He made it easy for people to buy their own homes. People who own their own homes take much better care of them. The neighborhood is nicer. Not only that, every one of the high rises, most people live in these government high rises, 85% or so live in these government high rises. Every high rise reflects the ethnic diversity of the country. So everybody, whether you're Malay, Indian, or uh, Chinese, you live together, you eat together, you work together, your kids go to school together. There's no Indian ghetto or uh, Malay slum. It, everybody lives together. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew was very big on uh, security, famously canes violent people and hangs drug dealers. Uh, but on the other hand, people have the security that their kids can play in the street, or anybody can, a woman can walk across all of Singapore any time of day or night and not worry about being accosted. So a little bit less on the freedom scale, more on the security scale. Uh, he set up the taxation system so that if you work, uh, you can work hard. If you want to buy luxuries, you're going to pay a tax for luxuries. Uh, but if you do any job, whether you're sweeping the streets or you're cleaning the lavatories or just selling bananas at the market, everybody's pay is topped up. Everybody has enough money to buy food, shelter, health care, and education for their kids. They're, the ante for happiness is covered in this country. Singapore is a place that does a great job of illustrating this notion of life satisfaction. It's a place where... Um, if you favor security, uh, if your values are conservative, if you're willing to work hard just so long as you know that there's a payoff, this is a place where people really thrive. On the other side of the planet, uh, we found a place with a completely different kind of happiness, but every much is every, much is every bit as important. Uh, in the highlands of Costa Rica, the Central Valley, uh, this is the area with, where people have the highest positive affect. In other words, they enjoy life day to day. Uh, this is the country whose first presidents were teachers. And unlike the rest of Central America, where the first presidents were often dictators, here the early presidents uh, went to Europe and were educa educa educated by the Social Democrats. Uh, they invested heavily in education. Uh, Costa Rica has the highest literacy rate in all of Central America, and it has so uh, for the past 60 or 70 years. About 98% of people can read. They invest heavily in public health. As early as the 1920s, there was fresh water throughout Central America. Every man, woman, and child in the country has the right to one free visit a year from a health ambassador. This health ambassador will come into your home if you're lonely, uh, spend some time talking to you, get your health record, take your blood pressure, uh, check you for diabetes, screen you for uh, depression, and catch a disease before it's a 911 uh, uh, problem. She'll go in the backyard, or he will go in the backyard to look for standing water. That's why there was never a big Zika outbreak in uh, Costa Rica. They don't have big problems with dengue and malaria, and even go in the refrigerator and coach people the right way to eat. Now, we tend to think of health and happiness as two separate things, but actually they're inextricably linked. You really can't be happy if you're not healthy. And in Costa Rica, they spend 1 15th the amount America does on health care, and they have half the rate of middle-age mortality. 
fact, the longest lived people in the world live in Costa Rica. And those longest lived people are among the poorest. Poorest actually live longer there. Completely pops the myth that you need money to be healthy. Uh, their notion of igualdad assures that whether you're able-bodied or disabled, straight or gay, uh, old or young, people are all afforded the same services. And it's a place where this X factor of Latin American happiness, if you control for everything else, uh, Latin Americans are happier than any place else. Costa Rica has the best manifestation of that Latin American X factor, uh, a factor that's favored by a population that puts huge emphasis on family, religion. No matter where you go in the world, religious people report higher levels of happiness than non-religious people, and they'll favor social interactions. The happiest people in the world socially interact face-to-face, -face, not Facebook, not FaceTime, six hours a day. So what we're doing at this conference. This kind of happiness, known as positive affect, uh, is the type of happiness that uh, draws people who really like to seize the day and save our life over uh, sacrificing too much today to save for tomorrow. And then I think one of the best examples of happiness in the world is here in, in Denmark. Denmark has most consistently topped the happiness scales for about 50 years. Um, several organizations measure happy. The best is Gallup. About 100 years ago, they suffered a crushing defeat. They turned inward. And this was the first country in the world to educate children of peasants. They were usually just thought of workers until uh, about the 20th century. Here in 1850, uh, these folk schools taught the children of farmers uh, art appreciation and consensus and civics. And most notably, they taught girls. This is the first place in the world where girls were given an education. First place in the world to start cooperatives, which led to unions, which led to universal health care and education. Uh, in, in Denmark today, everybody has free education through college. In fact, you're, you get paid to go to college. Free health care. And everybody who retires is assured a comfortable retirement. It also has the highest trust in the world. Uh, one of the biggest correlates to national happiness is trust. Do you trust each other? Do you trust the government? Do you trust the cops? And here, the best example of trust that I saw happen mid-morning in the cafes in Aarhus, where women would get together with their friends to chat, but because their toddlers were noisy, they just left them out in the, in the lobby. And for those crying little babies, well, they just parked them outside which is completely natural in Denmark, but when a Danish woman tried to do this in New York City, she ended up in jail. <laughs> Traditionally, it's been a very tolerant place. Uh, in America, we like to brag because just in the last 20 years or so, we started letting gays marry. Uh, but in Denmark, gays have been marrying for the past 50 years. And no matter what your values, there's a way to express them, whether you like to read the newspaper naked or ride your bike naked. <laughs> Don't try this at home. <laughs> and it's set up really so people can get the right kind of job. Uh, Denmark famously has the highest tax rates in the world. But on the other hand, all their needs are taken care of. So when people are deciding what they're going to do for a living, it makes no sense to favor a paycheck over a job that fuels your passion because you're going to get taxed to the mean anyway. So here's a place where the garbage man makes as much as the lawyer. So it favors uh, work, uh, professions like design, furniture making, and architecture. Some of the best uh, architects in the world are here in Denmark. And it reminds us that while we tend to think of happiness as the pursuit of joy, actually mitigating those things that cause us day-to-day -day stress is just as important. Uh, in Denmark, as I've said, they don't have to worry about whether or not they'll be cared for if they get sick, whether or not their kids will go to school, or whether or not they'll have a future after they retire. So three different parts of the world, three different kinds of happiness. There's one set of factors that explain each of the three places, a little stronger set that explains two. And then the sweet spot here, uh, these six factors explain about 90% of human happiness. Um, the first one, GDP, 
a gross domestic product. The thing to remember about GDP, though, it is a blunt instrument. GDP is important for poor countries, but after you hit GDP of about $25,000 a year or the GDP of Portugal, say, more GDP doesn't really bring much more happiness. There's diminishing marginal return. So after your country has made enough, if leaders are really interested in producing well-being and happiness, they would focus their resources on other things. I'd argue that the second most important thing to focus on is healthy life expectancy. Costa Rica produces the highest healthy life expectancy per capita than any place else in the world. Generosity, which is the propensity of people to donate. Tolerance, which is the freedom to live out your values. That doesn't necessarily mean the freedom to demonstrate or cause trouble or to do drugs, but freedom to live out your values. You live in a place where social interaction is easy. There's a very big correlation, by the way, between bikeability and the happiness in a place. The most bikeable place in the world is Copenhagen, Denmark. About 50% of all trips are done on bicycling, uh, on bicycles. And then the biggest, uh, and, and then uh, second biggest correlate is trust. Uh, do you trust your government? Do you trust your cops? And do you trust each other? And there are policies that will favor trust over, um, the, the, uh, will favor trust. So three types of happiness, but how do you apply them to your life? So I hired a couple researchers to do uh, an academic review of all the available research. So we can measure three types of happiness. Life satisfaction, how you evaluate your life, positive effect, how you experience your life, and purpose, which is more or less meaning. And there's one set of things you can do to favor each. If you're interested in life satisfaction, you work full time and make at least $75,000 a year. If you favor day-to-day -day joy, you make sure you get your seven hours of sleep. You vacation six weeks, which is the optimal. If purpose is important for you, you do the internal inventory and make sure you get the job you like. There's a few factors that fall in both categories. Uh, having faith seems to be good for both purpose and life satisfaction. Volunteering is good for both experience life and, and purpose. And having sex twice a week is good for not only how you experience your life, but how you evaluate it. And that may be a, a pearl of wisdom you, you guys might want to take home to your wives. And then there's the uh, sweet spot for individuals. Five or so things we know favor all three types of happiness. Um, so these are the things that will statistically make you happier. And the literature of positive psychology is full of different tricks and techniques to make you happy. But the problem with pursuing positive psychology is two things, twofold. Number one, the intervention only works as long as you're paying attention. So as soon as you quit uh, practicing gratitude and savoring, the effect goes away. And number two, other research shows that the harder we try to be happy, the more miserable we are. So if you really want to be happy, here's what I think you ought to do. And this is all driven by statistics. You want to shape your environment so you're more likely to be happy. So most of us live about eight kilometers from our home and work. I call this the life radius. And there's a number of things you can do to permanently shape that environment. So I have six different domains here. The first one is the individual. There's not much you can do to your inner self. But there is one thing that seems to work. People who go through an intense meditation experience, like vipassana, seem to rewire their, their brains for several years to be able to stay in the present more. Favors happiness. When it comes to finances, believe it or not, financial security is more important than consumption. So if you have a little bit extra money, you're much better off putting that extra money in an insurance policy or paying down your mortgage, or opting in for some automatic forced savings plan than you are buying a new pair of shoes or getting a new electronic gadget. When it comes to your home, though your re realtor will tell you to buy the cheapest home on the block, you're actually much better off to buy an average home on the block because you don't want to walk out your front door every morning and see a nicer car than yours and a bigger house than yours because it slowly grates away at our psyche. A few other things you can do in your house is make sure you have natural light, make sure you have a window that looks out on nature, and have the type of house that invites people in. 
Social networks, there's a lot you can do with your social network. Uh, the minimum we should all have are three friends that we can count on on a shitty day. We can have meaningful conversations with them and we actually like them. And for every new happy person we add to our network, it increases our own chances of happiness by about 15%. When it comes to work, I pointed out the importance, especially for everybody in this room, the importance of pursuing your passion over a paycheck. It's a much better strategy in the long run. But Gallup asked two million employees over the course of five years what the most important determinant of whether or not they were happy. And guess what it was? What are Expectations. Expectations. That's close. The biggest determinant of whether or not you like your job is do you have a best friend at work? So whatever you can do as an individual to find that best friend or as an employer to help foment uh, friendships at work, uh, you should see job satisfaction going up. And finally, the most important thing, and this I think will shock you, if happiness is a cake recipe, so you have to have the right job, uh, you want to marry the right person, you want to be healthy, you want to um, uh, feel like you're giving back, et cetera, et cetera. The most important variable in that cake recipe, the most important ingredient is where you live. So two experiments worldwide have been done. One from uh, immigrants from Moldavia moving it to Copenhagen. Moldavia tends to be one of the least happy places in Europe, but when they move to Copenhagen, their happiness about doubles, from four to about eight. And a bigger study has just been completed by a friend of mine named John Hollywell in Canada. He followed 500,000 immigrants from less happy places like Africa and Asia, followed them as they came to Canada, and within one year, those less happy people, regardless of their age, their gender, their level of education, were reporting the happiness level of their adopted home. So if you're unhappy now, about the most important, the most powerful thing you can do is move to a happier place. And the data now exists, uh, not only nationwide, but within nations, to tell you where that happy place is. So science cannot assure anybody in this room happiness, but it can tell you how to stack the proverbial deck in favor of happiness. And with that, I want to just close with the best advice I got in a year and a half of traveling. I, I uh, met the, the happiest guy in Latin America. His name is Aguirre Fuentes. They call him El Caton. He writes four articles a day. He's 85, year old, five, 85 years old. Uh, he said the secret to happiness is to eat without gluttony, drink without getting drunk, love without jealousy, never argue, and occasionally, with great discretion, misbehave. Thank you very much. <laughs>